suffering and the anguish and then burden there and quickly realize no Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Namo saranto suchedoye alahadi sammya sampatoshi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, August 28th. We are into Virgo. And welcome to our Avatamsaka Sutra lecture today. It is Saturday the 27th back in California, Saturday evening. Uh, if you have come to listen to the Flower Garland Sutra, you are in the right place place. So let's begin, first of all, by invoking spiritual presence here. We do it with a melody and uh, we uh, are inviting the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly to draw near. Here we go. our opening protocols, we'd like to acknowledge country, say that the Kumbumari people of the Ugambe language group practice spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to all creation here in this location for tens of thousands of years. Today, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land. We acknowledge them with gratitude as we share this land today with sorrow for the cost of that sharing and with the hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all First Nations peoples whose sovereignty was never ceded. Okay, later on in our program today, we're going to be taking another look at uh, Australia and the red heart of Australia, Uluru. All right, I wanted to say that here in the uh, Uda Hall at Gold Coast Dharma Realm. There, since we last were here, I've been uh, in two other locations here on campus for the last month because we've had a medicine, I'm sorry, a Urstor Bodhisattva Dharma Assembly, which involved 
reciting 100 volumes of the Urstor Bodhisattva Sutra in 30 days. So that merit and virtue is complete. And uh, this, you can feel the, the energy in our Buddha hall here from the resonating sounds of Urstor Bodhisattva's wisdom and compassion. So that has happened. I want to acknowledge that. Now, um, to get us started, uh, we've invoked this, invited the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to come. I would like to uh, bring us up to speed. We're looking at chapter 20 of the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's called the verses in praise in a palace of the Suyama heaven. That's the name of the chapter. And the, uh, the story goes that the Buddha announces he wants to deliver another section of the flower garland sutras teachings, which in this case is called the 10 practices and also the 10 inexhaustible treasuries. So that's, that's coming up. And uh, the Buddha announces that by releasing light from different parts of his body. And the light went out and the, body, the lights uh, permeated out. And from all directions, the bodhisattvas who were supposed to be here saw the light and came. And one other important being saw that and prepared. This was a, a, a deva, a god, who was in charge at the time of the Suyama heaven. And so he prepares as well. And he prepares by creating a, a, a place where the Buddha can live and speak. Um, it's called a palace of the Suyama heaven. And chapter 19 that we explained just uh, previously talks about how, uh, how the how the deva in charge, how the, the, they call him the Tianwang, the celestial king, um, put together a place suitable for the Buddha to welcome him. And all the decorations, all the adornments, all the, the fanciness that has to be in place when the Buddha comes to, uh, to talk. And so he did that and he, the Buddha arrived, the Buddha accepted the invitation and the, the deva king uh, said to him, you know, 10 other Buddhas have been here, at least. I want you to know their names and what we did for them and what they did for us. And the theme of the praises was for that reason, this place is the most auspicious. There is a light and an energy here that is unmistakable. And you just, it makes every one of your cells just stand up and cheer. So, uh, the Deva King lets the Buddha know that he is really welcome. And so the, the throne, the chair, the seat is ready. The Buddha accepts it, sits down. 10 Bodhisattvas arrive with all of their following. And these are Bodhisattvas from different directions, from different worlds. And they identify themselves. They arrange their seats, sit down, getting ready to listen. And then, one by one, all 10 of the bodhisattvas in succession stand up, do the appropriate protocol. They take incense and walk around the Buddha and offer the incense and then bow, kneel, palms together and sing. They do spoken word poetry. It's a poetry slam here in front of the Buddha. And these are the praises that the title of our chapter gets its name from. This is the praise that they sing. And each of the bodhisattvas has a different topic. And we've been through forest of merit and virtue. We've been through forest of wisdom and forest of victory, those three. We're on bodhisattva number four. We're going to hear from today for the first time. And his name is forest of courage, bodhisattva. In Chinese, it's uh, wei lin pusa. No fear forest in Chinese, word for word. So instead of saying fearlessness, fearlessness works, forest of fearlessness, grove of fearlessness, but courage is a stronger word. Uh, it's not something that's missing, fear is missing, it's that courage is present. So for, forest of courage, Bodhisattva is about to speak to us and his topic is faith. Faith and the benefits faith. Interesting. 
Um, so we'll we'll see what he has to say and get to it right now. Okay, here we go. Then, Bodhisattva Forest of Courage received the Buddha's awe-inspiring strength, contemplated everywhere in all directions, and chanted the following verses in praise. So this is a kind of a boilerplate passage. We hear it 10 times in our chapter as each different bodhisattva stands up and then kneels and sings his heart. It lets the Buddha know how he feels about being here in the presence of the Buddha to, uh, to, to learn and to uh, prepare to take what he learns back to the world where he came from. Because these, these, these are hardworking bodhisattvas. They, uh, they're wearing running shoes on their feet and uh, they, they're tired a lot because they're involved in the work of du zhong shang, hua zhong shang, teaching living beings, taking living beings across. And that's hard work. Uh, we are notoriously hard to change our minds. We don't change our minds very often. We're pretty stubborn. And uh, there you can, the bodhisattvas there saying, here are all the good reasons why you should get vaccinated against the COVID virus. And there's so many good reasons. And there's so few bad reasons that the, and the bad, the reasons that you hear not to do it are all dubious, spurious, phony, false information reasons, people's ignorance and their fears and their emotions. And all the scientists and all of the good people who by the billions now who have received the, the virus, the vaccine, who have received the vaccine have survived and have made it through and they can continue with their lives now. And oh my goodness, you shouldn't cling to those emotional fears and, and the misinformation. That's, that's a non-dharma. That is fei fa zhi shi. It is actually gets close to being xie jian, wrong views. The bodhisattvas talk like this. And uh, what do living beings say? Living beings say, I don't think so. I think I'll just cling to my wrong views. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to change my mind. And the bodhisattva goes, okay, we'll find some way. We'll, no worries, no worries. All good. We'll get you there because we want you to survive. We want, to, we want you to continue living. We don't want you to get sick. So we'll get that vaccine into you somehow. So that's why bodhisattvas look tired a lot because they, we living beings are very notoriously stubborn. So that's why the bodhisattva forest of courage now receiving the Buddha's awe-inspiring strength looks around and sees who his audience is and chants the following verses in praise. So these are definitely, uh, um, these are uh, singable. They're metered, metric. They beat, bum, 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 right? These are verses. They're not prose. This is not a, a lecture. It's not an essay. It's a song. It's poetry. So what does he say? He says, Rulai guang da shen, jiu jing yu fa jie, wu li yu ci zuo, the Tathagata's extensive body extends throughout the Dharma realm. Without leaving his seat on this dais, he appears everywhere in all places. So he's uh, the topic, uh, according to our Tang Dynasty commentator, Chang Guan Fa Shi, Qingliang Guoshi, Master Cheng Guan, says this is about faith. And I've, I've got actually have his, his actual quote. Let's, let's look into the Tang Dynasty right now and see what he says. He says, make this a little bigger. 
well, I want to take you, like, share with you the, the thrill of reading words that are 1400 years old here. Yi xin, le, li, or xin yao li, because of the strength of joy in faith. So using the power of the joy of faith, wen shen wei, when this bodhisattva hears the Dharma, he is profoundly free of fear. Ming Weiling. That's why we call him Forest of Courage. Okay, isn't that neat? So he says, this Bodhisattva is, he has, uh, this is Master Chung Guan's commentary. He says, our Bodhisattva here, who is our speaker for these next 10 verses, he believes that the Buddha is exactly what he appears to be, which is awake. He really believes that. And he believes that the Buddha's intention is to make everyone who wants to successfully follow him. He wants to make Buddhas out of everybody who wants to follow the Buddha. He wants them to succeed in realizing the Tao, realizing the way. So he believes that and he gets happy because of that faith and that joy in his heart gives him strength. He really understands that he has the potential to come out of the darkness of ignorance and come all the way home to his own mind. And that makes him happy and his happiness gives him strength. He, the more Dharma he hears, no matter how profound it is, he's not afraid. And I wanna, that's, people might say, well, yeah, why is that a big deal? It's because, hmm, once you go poking around the roots of the psyche and say things like, you know, your personality is completely a construction, that there's really nothing there, it's really empty. And if you go back in there and look around for a soul, you actually don't find it, you don't really exist. <laughs> when you say things like that, people hear it in all different ways. And one way they hear it is to run the other way. Run the other way. I. Uh, I, a lot of my personal religious uh, journey, that's the language we use, happened with uh, uh, Marty Verhoeven, formerly Hong Chao. Uh, he and I were companions for a decade plus, and, and I was dependent on him because I wasn't talking, and he was talking for both of us. So any teaching that came from Master Hua to Marty had to go through me because Marty didn't speak Chinese and I was the translator and I was permitted to speak when, when it was between Marty and, and Master Hua. So I got to, I had a front row seat in Marty's personal transformation. And uh, we, he and I both uh, registered our fears in different ways. We clung to different things when it got heavy. And uh, mine was food and Marty's was clothes. <laughs> the emperor, he was the emperor. And Marty really had a thing about his robes looking nice. And of course for monks, it's, you know, it's not fashion. It's just, you want your robe to look nice. So when Shurfu would say something to us that was just right down there, shaken up the foundation of your life, um, we, we would register it in different ways. I would dive into food and he would dive into uh, a not different rope. So um, at one point, Master Hua uh, gave us um, a text to memorize and it was called the uh, Qing Jing, Jing Tai Shang Lao Jun Qing Jing, Chang Qing Jing, Jing, the sutra, the classic of purity and stillness, it was called. And the classic of purity and stillness is a Taoist slash Buddhist text. It's a cultivator text. At that level, you don't really worry, is it Buddhist, is it Taoist? But it, was, it's, uh, it talks about how when you end desire, uh, the only thing left is emptiness. 
And when you empty out emptiness, you get to the Tao. And you have to do that to get to the Tao. And Marty, for some reason, uh, just glommed onto this text. I suspect he, he'd read this before, and that's probably why Sherpa gave it to us when the time was right. But we were uh, bowing at the time every day, weren't interact, interacting with anyone. So whatever we read had a huge impact. And so here's the Qing Jing Jing, classical purity and stillness, which was a, uh, it's outside of the mainstream Buddhist literature. And yet it was, uh, Master Hua said, okay, you're ready for this now. So he, he, we, uh, we both read it and we translated it. And so the, the Chang Jing Jing Jing, and Marty's reaction was so visceral, this text scared him. It scared him. And he, and I, he, you know, he, because he read it so deeply and he absorbed it and he was trying to memorize it. And I remember he um, didn't want to get out and bow that day. He kind of stayed in full lotus. He stayed and meditated. And, you know, I wrote a note, what's going on. And he said, this, this sutra freaks me out. It's classic. It's, it's a king, but it's not a Buddhist sutra. It's a, classic so and he acknowledged and then he wrote in his essay in his journal because we were journaling all through this that the truths of the ching jing jing shook him up he as he read them he not and it's not this is the point it's not the mind his you know this is a phd in history from university of wisconsin marty is no intellectual lightweight but the sutra bypasses your mind, your intellect. And it goes right down to that place where it says, wake up, you don't exist. And if you take it seriously, it's an existential threat to your very existence. And with the, the vocabulary that we use to describe what was going on was our bugs didn't like that. The bugs are the beings, your, your own living beings inside you that hear things completely straight without any intellectual mediation. There's no lawyer in there saying, well, this is actually metaphorical for uh, some other, this is mean, you know, symbolism. For, uh -uh. Your bugs go, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and so, so when, when I read about Forest of Courage, Bodhisattva, Wen Shen Wei, immediately I remember being back there uh, in our Plymouth car on the highway, reading the Sutra, the classic purity and stillness, the Qing Jing Jing, and having this ulp. So here it is. It says what? It says, this Bodhisattva, because of the strength and the, jo the strength of joy of faith. So we heard, you know, the joy of cooking cookbook. This is the joy of faith and its strength. Because of that, when he hears profundity from the Buddha, he's not afraid. So the conclusion here is that if you truly banish doubts, if we really just give our hearts to the understanding that the Buddha is the result of uncovering your nature, the, Buddha, the Buddha's wisdom results from fearlessly opening all of your faults and your habits and your attachments and your opinions and letting them go, really believing that those things are all acquired and clung to by us, that we can choose to hold them or we can choose to let them go to really believe that and then let them go, the result is joy, freedom. And there's a strength there. If we really believe that, no matter what the Buddha explains, we won't be afraid. Um, yeah, how deeply do we cling to our habits? Oh yeah. Mm. Just try cutting out coffee. Try doing without your phone. Woo. Yeah, take a data Sabbath. 
let your let your devices go for so you look at here's an example of there are people who know what i'm talking about which is jewish friends who keep kosher who keep the sabbath and once a week and really do it you know do not drive you walk you don't operate electric lights maybe you know is it lights electricity that's i don't that's pretty deep i have friends who nothing they don't turn any switches so they really live on a spiritual calendar and because of the power of their faith they let go all things that are not of god you know then look at muslims who do ramadan ramadan is fasting and you don't eat and you don't drink that's a spiritual calendar you know what time is it oh it's ramadan month so we're going to do without nourishing our bodies during daylight hours and what happens you get strength and i know a lot of catholics who would say they wish that they were still eating fish on friday they catholics had a practice when i was growing up many some many still do of meatless fridays fish on friday so any time because of faith we let go of habit of desire of comfort of custom and we say my priority is my connection with the sacred and with the holy there is strength you the result of that is yeah i can do that i i faced it and this i don't need to be afraid it's not so scary after all so our bodhisattva bless his heart one shun wait because he hears what is profound and he is not afraid so his name is forest of courage and he's going to his praises ji ta his uh the the praises that we're about to hear these verses of praise talk about how faith brings benefits and the profound virtues that come from that from his faith so the deep virtue that comes and the benefits from uh acting on that faith it takes what does it do it takes some courage you have to be willing to undergo what you undergo the discomfort of novelty of something new and different the customary way that i've always done it habits comfortable it's just, we just kind of roll along and we don't change but you can sure get into a rut and get into a place where the spirit leaks out and before you know it everything goes flat so that's why friends are so important having friends spiritual friends who can give us that push we need to get out of the rut and to go try try letting go try something different try a little different friends give us a push and say oh you didn't want to get vaccinated let's get vaccinated and you do it and you know what happens nothing no worries no problems and you're healthy same with giving up all kinds of habits so the tataka does extensive body extends throughout the dharma realm he doesn't leave his seat there on the dais but because his dharma body pervades everywhere so he is in all places at once yeah profound but that's part when your dharma body is working when your dharma body is alive you too you too here we go one sorry one more time ro wen ru shi fa gong jing xin yao zhe yong li san u dao yi qie zhu ku nan someone who upon hearing this teaching feels respect belief and delight will depart forever from the three realms of misery free from their suffering and difficulties okay the first of those benefits that come from faith is you don't worry about the hells the animals and the ghosts realms 
free from the suffering and difficulties of the three evil destinies. For this to make any sense, um, you need a bigger view than the one, well, I guess it depends on the stories you've heard. So when I was growing up in my Methodist community, we occasionally would get to hear about the other Protestant Christian churches that were available in where I was growing up in the Midwest. And there was one kind of a cliche, there was one um, image of, there was always a white clapboard church out in a recently cleared uh, forested area. And the preacher on a Sunday morning would tell you about the hells and the hells that he would stoke in his sermon were white hot, red hot hells, black hot hells. And he would tell you, everybody in the, the, in the congregation, that you were a miserable lot. You were sinners and you were going to hell and it's hot and you never get out and the devil stokes that hell and you are miserable in that hell until you repent sinners and he would tell you how to repent and every sunday morning the preacher would just depict this hell and scare you his job was to scare you so you would pull away from the path as he said your ship is heading to the shoals and once your ship hits the shoals, it breaks up and you drown and you fall into the hells and you suffer forever. Oh my goodness. So that was the cliche, that was the, uh, uh, the stereotype was about the white clapboard church on a Sunday morning and the preacher who would, who would uh, start to foam at the mouth as he would tell you about the hells. And of course the congregation comes out of that, uh, if he was a quality, uh, preacher, given his sermon, his his uh, uh, discourse, his comments, you would he would wind up saving you, telling you that it was the path to salvation that comes from belief in Jesus Christ our Lord and the gospel, and so he would send you to hell and then pull you back up, and when you were done. Oh, we're saved finally. So what would you do? You would cling to the cross. Hallelujah. Praise his name. So that was the stereotype. And other than that, other than, and of course, as we moved into the post-war generation, baby boomers um, had less use for that kind of fundamental message from the man of God, from the holy, from the preacher man. As we moved into cities and away from rural communities, the church became less and less the place where we congregated. And we met where the biggest, the biggest crisis for the life of the church television. Because, and this, this was interesting. Uh, I actually wrote an essay um, about this, when I, as I mentioned bowing, um, I did a pilgrimage at one point in my religious formation as a monk. And together with uh, Hung Chao, Dharma Master Hung Chao, I traveled through the backyards of coastal California for two years and a half. And bowing on the highway and sometimes on city streets, we got to see exactly where people in California, California may not be the representative of America, but it is indeed, because uh, California is the melting pot. We got to see how people live on Sunday and then the rest of the week. And what we saw was many, many, many churches for sale. 
that had been abandoned by their congregation because they aged and the young people didn't come. And we saw television antennas sprouting up from the roof of every single house. And this is in the, the 70s. So it was already 50 years ago, half a century ago. But the television antenna brought the rise of the television, televised gospel, the TV preacher. And so people didn't have to go to the church anymore. And oh my goodness. So as the churches vanished and the Sunday morning congregation now watched Oral Roberts, televangelist, right? Televisions evangelists. Oh gosh, those communities dried up. And as they dried up, that message went along with it. The idea that we need to be concerned about the hells. I suspect if you went and talked to your grandma or your grandpa and asked them if they'd ever heard such a message about the hells and about how you could fall and what they were like and how hot they were, um, if they grew up in a, a Christian home uh, during the 20th century, chances are they had heard that message. They would know about the hells. Where do we hear about the hells now if we do it all? Video games, manga, Japanese comic books. Um, I don't know, Marvel, Marvel movies, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, maybe they occasionally, hells open up. And so it's, it's gone into the realm of literature and fantasy and sci-fi, science fiction, but it's not a reality anymore for my grandparents' generation who on Sunday morning reliably heard about the hells and were told that it is a place you can go and unless you believe in the Lord, you're going to fall. And it's miserable in those places. One of my best memories of that is, bless his heart, former Vice President Al Gore. Al Gore, Tennessee, wonderful man. Uh, one of the most significant, well, won a Nobel Prize for his work with uh, environmental causes and with the passage of the uh, the um, what's it called the reduction bill the inflation reduction act ira um, he is now current again people are talking to al gore again because now we have money to fund you know the united states just made its largest investment in environmental uh action ever in history so al gore is in the news again but we we loved al gore but his his style of stump speech was called wooden at best. He, Al and his father, his father was a famous politician in the state of Tennessee. And uh, he, um, Kentucky, Nashville, Kentucky, Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, so Al was not the most dynamic speaker. He, he was a wonk and he could talk policy to the end of days. And, just give you all the facts and figures in a very well-meaning but not dynamic way. And so at one point, and of course, his boss, Bill Clinton, came from Arkansas and knew all about Black preaching. So at one point, they sent Al Gore to learn from Black preachers how to, how to uh, perk up his delivery. And I remember uh, they, there was a, a moment when in the White House, they, they ask Al to, uh, to demonstrate what he had learned from his African-American uh, preaching skills, how to do the, the homily. And he gave a, he saved us from hell. And it was believable. It was wonderful to hear Al Gore wind it up and you know, his voice rises up and, you know, you're going to burn, you'll burn. And, 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 oh, it was just great because he really could do it. So anyway, back to the hells. So what about the hells? The three realms of misery. What do we mean when we say you'll depart forever from the three realms of misery, free from their suffering and difficulties? 
Well, if you've never heard of the hells, who cares? That's some fantasy. What are you, what are you obsessed? You negative person? Why don't you get happy? You know, go, go dancing. Why are you so obsessed with, with suffering? It's because nobody takes the hell seriously unless you've heard the story. It just sounds too awful to be believed. But here's the point. People might, uh, I certainly didn't know that the, that the Buddha Dharma also talked about the hells. But when you face off, as I mentioned at the start of the lecture, here in this room, here in this Buddha hall, over the past 30 days, the Urstor Bodhisattva Sutra has been recited 100 times, three times a day, um, and the merit transferred, trans uh, dedicated out. So um, the Urstor Bodhisattva Sutra, Urstor, uh, Kshitagarbha Bodhisattva, Dizang Pusa, is unique among other bodhisattvas in the Mahayana pantheon for the quality of his vows. And what are his vows like? He said, I will not become a Buddha until the hells are empty. Uh, only after all living beings have been taken all the way up to Buddhahood will I myself realize Buddha. Those two vows are endless. There's no time that the hells are going to be empty because we living beings are constantly making or behaving in ways that, that destroy our human bodies and send us to the hells. Not forever. The Buddhist hells are not permanent. You work your way out when that karma is over. But the Buddha Dharma teaches the hells as real hot places of punishment that are happening right now. No, vac no vacations, no weekends off. And they, they don't exist at all until living beings, until we people, sentient creatures, create the karma that calls in that retribution. And so the hells exist only because people create them as a, an effect of the causes. So cause and effect, that law of the universe creates the hells. And as the, the Buddha described them, they're part of a, of a system. And it's a six spoked wheel. That's one of the images that's given. It's a system that is not negative, it's not depressed, it's not pessimistic, it's part, it's reality that also includes an optimistic, positive side in the Asuras, humans, and devas, trinity of the six, the three parts of the six, kind of, I think of uh, anybody pay attention to the book of changes and the trigrams, so they've got three above and three below, six has we to to translate them how do we translate at this time it was the three realms of misery we used to say the three evil paths right san e dao in chinese and let, let's think of six so you can think of three and three like this three and three okay so from the bottom up it's the hells it's the ghosts and it's the animals realm those are called san e dao the three realms of misery the three evil destinies evil is not that's not a good you don't think of animals as evil so but they're they can be miserable the walt disney version of animals is not the reality of many animals lives so hells ghosts animals those are places where people you and me can find ourselves reborn if we create deeds with body, mouth, and mind that call on that kind of retribution. Furthermore, having a human body, being reborn as an Ashura, a Titan, you think of the Greek mythology, or being born in the heavens, of which there are multiple heavens, that is also 
exactly a result of deeds done with body, mouth, and mind that call on the retribution of humanity, Asuras, or gods in the heavens. So uh, later on, okay, um, in this very chapter, in our chapter 20, right where we are, the power verse is coming up. It's down at the bottom as number nine of the 10 bodhisattvas. It says, if, if someone really wants to know where Buddhas of the three periods of time come from, contemplate the nature of the entirety of all the Dharma realms, how everything is made from the mind alone. So these three evil destinies, the three realms of misery, made from the mind, as is humanity, Asuras, and the Devas realm. We are responsible for creating our future rebirth in every detail. The gender that we come back, the gender of the body that we come back in, the kind of body that we come back in, the environment surrounding the body that we are born into has everything to do with what we do in our last incarnation. So that's the teaching here. So Forest of Courage, Bodhisattva says, if you hear about the Buddha's ability to manifest his Dharma body and that kind of freedom and that kind of power, and it makes you happy, if you feel respect and belief and delight, when you hear that teaching, that's enough to close for you, they say, the doors of the three evil destinies, free from suffering and difficulty. How about that? So, okay, now I'm going to take us briefly back to that Sunday morning preacher in the white clapboard church. If you grew up on the farm, if you didn't have an opportunity to read widely, and mostly what you read was the Bible, when the preacher man tells you that the hells are hot and stoked and waiting for you, and you can fall and you can burn, you believe it. And it might scare you into being good. You might not. You might hear it in one ear and still go on and be bad. But at least you've heard it and you considered that. And you might use that that knowledge system, that depiction of the way the world works to be the backbone of your understanding, your beliefs. Your beliefs will be born from the stories you heard, what, what you heard on Sunday. If instead you read a lot, maybe you had a chance to go to college and you learned about the advantages of uh, the modern world and you moved away, got off the farm, and maybe watched entertainment and learned how to dance and do all the ungodly things that, that the 20 and 21st century, the 20th century and the 21st century. Or, or check this one out. How profoundly we live in a different world. Suppose you went to war. Suppose you went from rural Vermont to France and faced an artillery barrage or mortar fire, or suppose you went up into the air in a B-24 and got shot at by German artillery and dropped bombs on Ploiesti, Romania and watched the bombs explode the oil. When you come back down, you've been through hell and you've seen humanity at its very worst. And a certain number of people would believe deeply in the message. Others would just say, God doesn't exist. I'm not gonna take that story anymore because I've seen what people do and it's hellish. Your, your, your ability to believe the words of a preacher man, uh, faced with what you actually saw with your own eyes and ears and skin, how profoundly conflicted you become. 
And so that gave rise, that experience of the Second World War, First World War, Second World War, and then Korean War. This I'm speaking from an American perspective. I'm sure it's true here from Gallipoli, Anzac. You know, they talk about the, the war in Gallipoli, in Turkey, as being hellish. Uh, Ten days of solid shelling and people dying left and right. Those experiences created uh, the alienation of the 20th century. And in France, it became, you know, the existentialism of Jean Paul Sartre and, and all of the, the anomie uh, in England. Uh, I, I can't speak for the British experience, but in America, uh, the baby boomers that, that grew up after that war um, lost their way. And, and those old stories about the existence of the hells, did they lose their power? I guess so. But when the world around you is exploding in fire and death is whistling past your ears and you see human bodies exploding, uh, the hells somehow, it's not somebody else's story. It's right there in daylight. You don't have to go anywhere. So what a, what a challenge for a new theology to arise, to replace the old story, because reality is worse than the, the hells promised by the preacher, you know? So if the, probably what, one of the most interesting changes in religion that happened in my lifetime was seeing on Time Magazine, and there, when I was a teenager, Time Magazine, Shi Jian Zacher, was a big public bellwether, probably as important as the internet in terms of the whole country at once uh, coming face to face with a new issue. And I'll never forget the one that I saw, Is God Dead? Remember that one? Is God dead? The the the, uh, the debate, and how could we get to the place? People, the the article in Time Magazine was debating, you know, where how how come people were thinking this way? Isn't this terrible? Isn't this blasphemy? And if you had to point to anything that gave people that idea, it was warfare. That people go to war to destroy each other's lives. And the government pays for it and often creates it. That was the time of the Vietnam War, the is God dead controversy arose. So, okay, now I launched into this whole topic because our Bodhisattva brought up the idea of the hells. And my question would be, here's our Sunday preacher telling you that the hells are, are there and scaring you and then saving you again. Did you know, I'm going to tell you about this awful place. You can go there. You're going to go there unless you accept my story and cling to the cross. Praise Jesus. So the preacher's job is to scare you and then save you both and get you to accept his way to salvation. Jesus is way. So what is our Bodhisattva doing? He's saying, if you hear the Buddha Dharma and something happens inside you, which is you respect it, you believe it, and you're happy about it, you don't have to worry about losing your human body and becoming a ghost, an animal, or a hell being. Because there is the hearing of it the respecting it, the believing it, and the joy creates something called shan, gan, wholesome roots, good roots of goodness. You get, there's a transformation that happens inside your mind and your nature when you hear the Buddha Dharma and delight in it. And so what is he doing? Praise the Buddha. He's saying, praise Buddha. Hallelujah. Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva, he's saying, from hearing the Buddha. 
And you don't have to worry about three realms of misery. Where do we run into that promise again? Um, in chapter 40 of the Sutra, the very last chapter, there's a pilgrim whose name is Sudhana, Shan Sai Tongzi. And he has a conversation with Pu Xian Pusa, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. Samantabhadra answers his questions that he has asked previously to 52 teachers. And the question is, how do I cultivate Bodhisattva practices? How do I walk the Bodhisattva path? How do I become a Bodhisattva? And Samantabhadra says, okay, 10. There are 10 steps. Number 10, number 10 is dedication of merit. We shall, we'll do that in just half an hour. We'll, we'll be dedicating merit here. And he says, ah, he says, here's what you do. I want you to dedicate merit with these wishes. I want you to make some, you give it away. You give away all the goodness that you've got. All of the shangan, the good roots that you've got, give it away. And you give it away with, and he lists this whole wonderful list of good things that you can do with your gongda, with your merit and virtue. And he says, okay, I want you to yuan guan bi yi che zhu e qu man kai shi ren tian nie pan zheng lu. He says, I want, I dedicate merit with the wish that the doors to the hells, the animals and the ghosts close and the paths to humanity, the heavens and nirvana open. Dedicate merit with those wishes, he says. So when I read that, I thought, so the gate, the doors to the hells, the animals and the ghosts close. Is where's that door? Is it somewhere near Los Angeles? Probably. Southern California, for sure. We, we say that as Northern Californians, so never mind. There's a rivalry. LA was going to secede, or no, I guess Berkeley was going to secede first, become the People's Republic of Berkeley. So anyway, that there are doors to the hells, the animals, and the ghosts was always interesting. And that you want to dedicate merit so that for living beings, you cut off the possibility. Furthermore, those of you who recall when you took refuge with the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, it might have been here in this room, here in our Buddha hall. It might have been in the Buddha hall at City of 10,000 Buddhas or uh, the, the City of the Dharma realm or some other monasteries. Maybe it was some other Mahayana monastery where you took refuge in the refuge ceremony. If it was done fully and completely, they say at the end, well done. Today, you have planted a cause, you planted a seed down that will keep you from falling into the, losing your human body and becoming a ghost, an animal, or a hell being. Well done, congratulations. So that's, so when you took refuge, they say that's a reason to not have to worry about. And it's funny, again, you're in that position as the speaker of that teaching to say, Okay, I got to tell you that you could become a hell dweller. However, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's like, I want to scare you, but it's all right. Very funny. So, yeah, if we don't even know that the hells exist, that there's a possibility, then why be afraid? Well, when you read the Urstor Sutra, not only do you come face to face with the reality of the hells, but itemizes them, the names of the hells and what it's like. Urstor Bodhisattva is looking directly at the dark side of the moon. He's looking at the, the thorns on the rose stem. When you look at a rose, do you ever look at the thorns? Nah, you look at the blossoms. Do you ever look at the leaves? Nah, you look at the color. Do you look at the stem of the rose or the roots, the cane? Nah, you don't. You look at the, the variety, right? We, our eyes go right to the pretty part, but there's no rose without the stem, without the leaves, without the thorns, without the roots of that cane. There's no humans 
Asuras and gods without the ghosts, the animals, and the hills. First door Bodhisattva shows us that place where we don't like to look. That's, that's his, where he chose to live. He lives down there in the hills. He is a 10th stage Bodhisattva, Shirdi Bodhisattva. So he can handle it. He's got asbestos for nerves, unburnable. I guess, no, no, I can't say that anymore. Asbestos is no longer a good thing. We used to be able to say that. Asbestos is carcinogenic. So now what do we say? We say he's fireproof. He has got fireproof skin, fireproof nerves. So, okay, you're gonna leave the three realms of misery and all their suffering and difficulties. Were you afraid? Probably not. All right. So believe and take delight in the Buddha Dharma and you need not worry. Okay, one more. We'll do another one. Here we go. Ready? Uh, first of all, here, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Sec. Before we do that, I want to... Uh... Talking about not being afraid, we have a practice going, which is reciting the names of the seven Tathagatas. That's the notes page, don't want that. I want this one. There we go. There it is, right there. I shrunk the font so I could get it on one page. Ah, not quite. All right, so we start out by saying, reciting the names of the seven to talk to us. There we go. And these include fearlessness, the Bodhisattva beyond all fears, fearless Buddha. the names of the seven Tathagatas. Namo do bauru la, namo ba shangu la, namo nyam sha shangu la, namo kongo shangu la, namo li du e ru la, namo gandu angu la, namo ami tu la, namo do bauru la, namo ba shangu la, Uh, including with the Buddha apart from fear, fearless Buddha, like that. Okay, now we need one more verse here since we're sharing our screen already. Here it is. Ready? Here we go. Shu Wang Zhu Shi Jie, Wu Liang Bu Ke Shu. They will go to every world in number boundless, uncountable, and focus their mind wishing to hear of the Tathagata's strength of independent self-mastery. Lucky that melodic line allows many syllables, right? Probably focus their minds would be better. That's probably a typo. So these bodhisattvas will go to every world, no matter how many, in number boundless uncountable, and focus in, listen closely, because they want to hear 
here's the power line right here. Ru lai zi zai li. Let's take a look at the Chinese here. So Ru lai Tathagata, that's the title of the Buddha, thus come in this way, coming. Ru lai Tathagata, the one who appears this way in reality. Zi zai Ishvara, self-mastery, uh, sovereign self-mastery, free of any constraint, li, strength. So put that together, the Tathagata's strength of self-mastery. When we hear about that, sovereign self-mastery, independent self-mastery, when, when the bodhisattvas hear about that, they get what they need to become better bodhisattvas, better teachers, better examples, more fearless, more courageous. They can hear living beings' stubbornness and not be discouraged. They don't quit, all those things. They never forget their Bodhi resolve because of hearing about how the Buddha's si zai li um, completely allows the Buddha to do things that they hope to, be, hope to do when they become Buddhas in the future. So hearing about the Buddha's independent sovereign self-mastery, um, yeah, that's a praise. That's, this is our Bodhisattva forest of courage is here praising like that. So my goodness, um, I want to do something now. Let's see here. The, um, I want the other one again, please. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Um, just let me share my screen. Here we are. Okay. I, uh, this, this week, I was able to complete my um, application to become a citizen of this fair country, sunburned country called Australia. And it was a lot, a lot of hard work on behalf of many people on the part of many people to where I could do that. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge that and say how much I appreciate. We, we don't know if it will be successful, we hope so. Um, I'll be transferring a little bit of merit and virtue with that wish. But uh, I do want to acknowledge all of the hard work and generosity that uh, so many hands and hearts contributed to allow that to happen so that the Mahayana, the, the Chinese tradition of Buddha Dharma can, can come to Australia and make its home here. It's, it's home, but we need monks here too. The nuns are doing a tremendous job of, of planting down the Dharma, reciting a hundred Earth Store Sutras in one month is, is a testimony to that. Uh, but we need monks too. And so people have been sacrificing their strength and time to help me get to this place. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And uh, I found the melody here in Chinese on the banjo very nicely. People know Every day uh, at lunch, when we receive offerings as what are called Field of Blessing Sangha members, we give back the, the goodness. We say thank you for the food that we eat and everything else by uh, going Sado nan san miao san puto, juju nan da ju to nan, juli juli junti sopo ho. So we busher jo, be ho chili e, robe lo gusher, hobi do an lo, fancher ichi, dang yen jong shang, so zo jie ban, ju ju fo fa. We say that. And here it is. This is what we say. And it begins, many people don't actually connect that that's the trinti pusa shan jo. That's part of the 10 small mantras, is number five. And we do it in the morning, every day of the world, the shi xiao zhou includes the Jun Di Shen Zhou. And we say, 
you know, Sadonan, Samya Sampato, Jujanan, Dajar Tonan, Jili Juli, Junti Sopaha. And that mantra we recite again every day at midday after lunch when we say thank you for the vegetables. Uh, it's so clearly Junti Bodhisattva, who is said to be a transformed body from Guanyin Pusan. Uh, Trinity appears in a variety of forms, 16 arms or uh, 12 arms different, and has a lot of connections with people. Um, someone who recites the, the Junti Bodhisattva mantra um, is, gets all kinds of incredible good things happen. So I wanted to uh, bring, this, bring this forward and show you the, the Junti Mantra as the transference verse that we do every day. making offerings certainly obtain their rewards. They who take delight in giving will later surely find peace and happiness. Now that the offerings have concluded, make a vow for all living beings. May they have success in all they do and be perfect in all Buddha dharmas. That's what we say. So I wanted to send that out uh, with my gratitude for all the goodness that is coming my way. And hopefully uh, here in the fair land of Australia, um, we'll be able to con continue to contribute our strength uh, without leaving California behind, certainly, uh, but I'll be able to come and go freely with a passport. So we'll see how that, uh, how that works out. Um, the, with that in mind, I wanted to share something else quite wonderful that I discovered this week. And uh, this is, uh, it's not specifically the Buddha Dharma, but it has in it something quite wonderful. The, uh, the spirit of Australia is Qantas Airlines. It's their the national car flagship carrier airline. And Qantas uh, suffered a lot when Fortress Australia closed its borders. And during COVID, there were years when nobody could come or go from Australia. And during that time, it protected the citizens from COVID. Once the borders were <laughs> relaxed in January, uh, COVID arrived and now Australia is suffering from COVID. So it was only it, by forcibly keeping people away, we kept the illness away. But once the borders were relaxed, during the time that the borders were shut, poor uh, Qantas uh, airlines, like other airlines around the world, lost all their business and they let everyone go. 
furloughs. Since the borders opened, uh, Qantas has had to scramble and they've had a very hard time getting back to speed. There's lots and lots of unhappy flyers because there's their percentage of canceled flights is half, you know, you have 50, 50 chance of your, your plane not going, but they're not unique in that regard. Many airlines are suffering the same. Now, the point that I wanted to share was when Australia uh, relaxed its borders, people could come home. And those Australian citizens who were caught overseas had to stay apart from their loved ones for so long. And uh, of course, families that wanted to see elders or see new babies couldn't. And when the borders were finally relaxed, um, people, the return trips were so heartwarming and were so, you know, fundamental. We are social animals that uh, Qantas made a video to celebrate the return of Qantas to the air and the return of Australians to their beloved land. So this particular is you know, a minute and 20 seconds, I think. Let's see, how long is it? It's, it's a very brief, it's a song length because it's built around a song called I Still Call Australia Home. And my investigations <coughs> have shown me that very few people can watch this video without shedding a tear. Most humans, when they watch this, cry. And I was fascinated because what is it? There are many, many comments on the video. They say, I'm not Australian and I cried anyway. <laughs> I wanted to be Australian when I saw this. And so I wanted to show this as a uh, uh, part of my expression of gratitude for um, the opportunity to apply. I haven't got a reply, a reply from Australia from immigration, but we're hoping it will be favorable. Anyway, in the process of that, I've discovered this video and I want to find out whether those of you who are watching, who are not Australian, who didn't even consider the possibility, after watching this brief video built around the song, I Still Call Australia Home, which is, by the way, in the running for the new national anthem of Australia. Our current national anthem is Advance Australia Fair, which is a, a fine uh, kind of you know, on the Olympic, uh, on the Olympic dais, they play it behind the, the athlete who has just won a swimming medal. But it's, um, there are many people who feel that I still call Australia home, a song written not too long ago by a guy named Peter W. Allen might be a better, a better national anthem for Australia. So there is a strong push to replace Advance Australia Fair with this one. We'll see. All right, we're gonna play it. And you tell me whether or not tears come to your eyes. No matter
Some very skillful filmmaking there. Did you reach for a Kleenex? Oh my goodness. So let's take a look here. We've got, uh, first of all, this is Uluru. This is called the Red Heart of Australia. It used to be known as Ayers Rock, but the indigenous community now has taken full responsibility for administration of Uluru. And it's out in surrounded in the outback, not far from Alice Springs. And I've been there, wonderful place of dreaming and the brightest stars you'll ever see. And here is our indigenous auntie, who is the first human face, maybe first human face alive. And she is the spirit here. And then, uh, here they are, here are the three rules. And immediately you know, this is Australia. And we have the young girl from the choir singing. It's a scene of Sydney. Uh, we've got Kylie Minogue and we've got uh, Josh, is his Broom is his name? I forgot his name, this young man. And then Hugh Jackman pops up. Uh, someone who, is a social, oh, we get kids playing rugby out in the, the outback in a dusty side field, side yard. Here's Hugh Jackman, the boy from Oz, singing and coastal scenes from the Kimberley. Then the choirs come on and the choirs have this angelic sound, uh, you know. And okay, so all of this is in the dark, notice. This is all still sunrise, sunset, uh, but at this point, the two verses of the song have done, and she's still in the shadows. She's this pure spirit of Australia. Now we're in the sun, and a Qantas jet flies over it. And the uh, bridge to the song, and, the, 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 and this very poignant scene. Grandma meets her grandson for the first time. And she's through. So here's Ash Barty, who was the world's number one female tennis player until she retired. And we're back to Sydney, Sydney Opera House, iconic, and the Harbor Bridge and the ocean. So I'm not quite sure, is he, is this a Hindu puja? Uh, Football player, what's his name? Ben? Don't know. So really that's who he is. And what is he doing here? Okay, I didn't know. All right. No, a famous, iconic Australian. Adam. Love it. Okay. And then the Australian relationship with the ocean that surrounds us, because it is indeed an island. And there you see, here are the two swimmers. There's a beach. So this part of Australia is, and then we're here in the, the great outback, great empty Australian outback. What's the story with the two colors? That's, that's uh, it, the sea is naturally that color. Salt Lake, yeah. And the kids, this I think is very skillful. We have children's choirs switching with scenes of Qantas from the very beginning, begun by two, uh, two, two gentlemen who dared to create this airline out of nothing. And then all of the, re all of the, uh, the generations of planes, 
and all the reunions, tears, and notice the, uh, here's our digger with his akubra. And here we are. So this is the, the staff of Qantas now. Back to work, exchanging with the children's choirs. How powerful is that? So the dreamers and their reality, right? The dream of flying. Hugh Jackman, Kylie Minogue, the kids, and our spirit again, the Aboriginal auntie and Qantas. And notice at the very end, all the generations of Qantas icons, the logos, as they progressed to the current one. So really well done, just superb, you know. The, uh, the spirit of the air in Australia. And of course, aviation has been so important to, to Australia uh, because of the, the distances that you have to travel to get to Perth, for example. It's, it's uh, so far away from the East Coast and nothing in between, essentially. So anyway, uh, just to say that uh, as our Bodhisattva forest of courage uh, leads us into faith in the Buddha Dharma and teaches us how to avoid the three evil destinies. Um, at the same time, um, we're into new, a new era in the world where even breathing the air without vaccination in your veins can kill you. Um, the, we don't know how many viruses there are waiting as humanity is, seems to be losing its blessings. And we have a war where an atomic energy plant is under bombardment. And one mistake, we know what Chernobyl was like in the same country of Ukraine. And there's, they're now playing war games for real around the Zaporizhia energy plant, which supplies a huge portion of electricity for all of Europe continent of Europe. So it's a hard time to be alive in the world right now. Um, and it takes a lot of courage and fearlessness to keep your spirits high, keep your energy positive. So that's the job of, of 21st century bodhisattvas. And uh, Australia is playing a big part in that. We have a new, a new era in politics here in this country. And uh, we have a new applicant to become an Australian as well. So. All right, uh, that's it for me. We're going to ask uh, Jin Chuan or Jin Wei, maybe it's Jin Chuan sure this time, to tell us about the Berkeley Monastery events. And let's do it. Let me talk the phone. Okay, that's you, Jin Chuan, right? Are you, that's your, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Amitofo, here we go. Here's our website. So we have one uh, new announcement, which is Stephen Tainer will be starting a class on Buddhist teachings on mindfulness practice on September 14th, December 14th. And so for those who like to learn meditation and mindfulness especially, uh, this is a good time to tune in. It's online, so you can still listen in when you're wherever you are around the world in you want you want to, to that, say a word about steven so people have a sense um or i, I, I can if, if you'd like yeah maybe you can Dharma. i think you know it better than i do okay, i know okay. a little bit about him yeah if he has so steven so far yeah steven is trained in uh tibetan buddhist uh teachings he's trained in mahayana teachings He's trained in Taoist teachings. He is one of the most effective teachers for Westerners whom I've ever met. And also a very generous, open-hearted man who um, teaches because he loves it. And he has, he, uh, has taught how many, I don't know, thousands of students over the years. Um, Stephen came on to our staff at the Berkeley Monastery offering his services probably in our fourth or fifth year, I think. 
So he has been, uh, we've offered this class with, in his various iterations, this class with Stephen for almost two decades, I think, and uh, super effective. And once uh, Stephen also, he guides people through uh, beginning intermediate and advanced meditation. He is very knowledgeable. He spends uh, part of every year at Princeton University um, talking in to the inner in uh, writing and talking in the interface between science and, and meditation. So uh, Stephen has multiple books available. Stephen Tainer, if you look on Google, you'll find them. So um, he is a rare communicator for Westerners in terms of bringing the teachings of meditation alive. Okay, that's it. Great. Um, so other than that, I think the two scroll Ulan Banana has finished. Mm -hmm. So you can watch a recording if you wish. But tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m., we'll be doing our monthly Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit. I just got an email from those who are helping organize it. And we have over 300,000 recitations this uh, month. Tremendous. So yeah. a lot of people are all putting their hearts, you know, say positive vibes out into the world, um, helping with I think there's a lot of suffering around the world right now. So mm. wherever people's hearts want to extend to, that's a chance to do it together as a community tomorrow morning at 6.30. Okay. And going down. Um, this I think is coming up September 1st. The talk on loneliness. Why so lonely? A conversation on Buddhism, loneliness, and human connection by Doug Powers. And DRBU has been trying to put on a series of talks to speak to like, the modern condition. So they have both the DRBU students and staff kind of with Doug Powers having a conversation. So it should be a lot of fun. And also, uh, people know Doug, very insightful <laughs> on topics that are quite important. And people would like to join DRBU, you can still apply. I think this semester is probably too late, but for fall 2023, definitely uh, please consider it if you're interested in delving into great books and also great wisdom. Uh, here, maybe I want to mention the DBM online daily ceremonies uh, because we will actually be stopping our daily ceremonies on September 1st. Um, a group of us at the monastery will be going to join the Chan session at Snow Mountain Monastery on September, starting on September 3rd to the 5th. And so we're going to be gone for a while and we won't be starting up our ceremony until September 10th. So if you would like to do ceremonies with us uh, from before the 1st to the 10th, uh, we ask you can maybe join by watching the recordings. But we will be back after the 10th. But yeah, so that's, right. I think, the current announcements. I'm not sure when uh, Dr. Verhoeven's lecture will begin, but I think I'll probably start shortly as well. So. We stay posted for that announcement. Okay, great. All right, thank you for that. Um, you're looking at the screen, you're looking at three Ming Dynasty Buddha images that uh, grace the Buddha Hall at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Uh, they are absolutely spectacular. Uh, 400 year old Buddhas who have seen a lot in their lifetimes. And uh, there they are. Talk about inspiring, yeah. Okay, uh, we have one more thing to do, which is to recite the mantra of Medicine Buddha as a way, as an antidote to COVID-19. This is a genuine uh, Buddhist antidote. It's powerful. And anybody who is interested in Buddhist medicine should connect with Medicine Buddha's energy through this mantra. Um, I recite it when I'm out um, on the street or in a crowd. And while I can't see it chasing COVID germs away, I feel in my own heart that there's light there uh, instead of 
you know, fear or shadows or anxiety. And further, I feel like when I recite this mantra, there's a good energy that I can share with others. So it kind of leaves a trace, a trail, of whatever, wherever you happen to be as you recite. So let's use this to transfer merit, however you would care to do so. And that will do it for us for today. to the Buddhas together three times. How in respect to the Venerable Master, That's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Stay healthy. All me told. Bye bye.